Now, you've had so much good news that I just thought I'd begin with some bad news. Um, <clears throat> as you know, uh, the books that many other people, like the Greeks, ex respected uh, were somewhat different. And this is one of the holy books, or at least a highly regarded book uh, in, um, in Greek. Can you mention any pursuit of mankind in which the male sex has not all the gifts and qualities in a higher degree than the female? All the pursuits of men are the pursuits of women also, but in all of them, a woman is inferior to a man. Thank you. <laughs> That's what the Greeks thought. That's the kind of mentality that people had when the Apostle Paul wrote to them. Now, it's one thing to come forward and receive Jesus Christ as personal Savior, even to seek to make him the Lord of your life and not to have very much understanding, not to be able to understand what comes next. It takes a lot of time to re-educate yourself and to develop new attitudes. As we all know, it doesn't happen all at once. Uh, we know that the old things pass away and all things become new. But for those who had been taught that a certain way was right, that certain things were eternally true, it didn't come at once. Now, when the Apostle Paul wrote to the people of Corinth, he wrote to a really flaky bunch. And yet he said they came behind in no gifts of the Spirit. They had all the gifts, but they sure did mix them up. Now, one of the very pious and religious things that they did that we read about is that they got drunk at the Lord's Supper. <laughs> you mean you don't think that's religious? Well, let me tell you that it was very religious if you were worshiping Dionysus, the god of wine and madness. And you got drunk unto Dionysus. After all, he'd given to humanity the wonderful gift, not only of the vine, but also of fermentation. Dionysus himself had taught people how to make wine. Of course, could do some very interesting things. And so you celebrated by getting drunk. And Paul had to say, in Jesus Christ, we don't do this. He had some very stern things to say about getting drunk. Now, if you may remember some of those pictures I showed you, those of you who were here yesterday, as you found out already, I love to let the Greeks talk for themselves. And uh, when I'm not reading quotes for them, then I like to show you pictures, and we'll see some more pictures at the end of the hour. And um, they used to uh, do, uh, one of the things they did in honor of Dionysus was to switch clothing. Men wear women's clothes, women wear men's. We know from an author who lived right in the New Testament period that they were still up to it. The vase paintings that I showed you were earlier. They were about three or four hundred years before Christ, and there they were up to the same thing, uh, switching clothing, and uh, thinking that this was very religious. But when it comes to worshiping Jesus, this is not religious. Uh, this is not the way to go. We glorify the God who, according to Scripture, made male and female. And you remember I started out and said, since my husband wasn't here, I was going to try to cover all the Genesis material. Since Gilbert did so well yesterday, and I'll be getting back to some of the Genesis stuff, I'm going to reorganize what I'm going to do today, and I'm not going to go back so much to Genesis. I'm going to keep on with 1 Corinthians 11. But I would like to say that one of the big things that Paul is talking about here in 1 Corinthians 11 is that if you're a man, it's good. If you're a woman, it's good, and you don't need to switch. In some of the cults, there were males who would actually castrate themselves. I even showed you a picture of a man dressed up as a priest, and they would get so worked up in their religion that they would take a sharp stone or a, sharp, a broken piece of pottery and actually emasculate themselves. And then they would serve uh, the goddess Sibylle as she-priests. And they would wear jewelry. They remember the woman had, um, I mean, the man had a veil on, and he had earrings and all kinds of things, uh, demonstrating uh, that he was a woman. You could actually try to change your sex in honor of a god. And Paul says, "Not in Jesus Christ. We don't do this. We are male and female." Uh, Paul comes out and says 
that a lot of you people in this congregation were once led away by pagan idols. Now, the word he used was getting very worked up, very carried away. They did a lot of very unfortunate things, uh, often very destructive things. And particularly, the women often got into very, very destructive modes of worshiping. Now, the Creek community in general interfered with the free practice of women's religion with some right. Uh, I showed you pictures of women dancing, and I told you that uh, once every other year they would go on a big binge. Often they were not let outside their houses. Now, marketplaces in Greece were nice and broad and sunny, and they built beautiful public buildings, and they had wonderful porches where people could sit around and talk. And the men could go there if they were rich enough so they didn't have to spend all day working, and they could have wonderful philosophical discussions. And the women had to stay at home. Uh, they weren't even allowed to come to the window. I'll tell you a little story about that in a minute. Uh, they were not allowed to know what was going on. And the typical response, if we're to believe what the ancient authors wrote, if a wife asked her husband what was going on today when you met in the city council, his answer was, shut up, it's none of your business. Oh, some of you have heard that too? <laughs> it's not what Paul says to do. And so, instead of that, uh, Paul is going to ask his women to go and discuss Jesus when they get home. And he's going to say, bring them into the church. Bring them into the assembly. Uh, it's very interesting. The same word that is used for assembly in Greek is the word that is used for church. Aristophanes even wrote a play about how the women got so disgusted at the man, men for making war that one day they all got up early and they put on their husband's clothes. Here we go right off with the clothing switch. And they tried to talk in deep voices. And they marched into the assembly room because the first 400 people who got there were the assembly for that day. And they tried to outvote the men. Now, one of the interesting things that they had to practice on the way, besides talking Greek, I mean talking deep, of course they had to talk Greek too, was that they had to learn to swear by a different bunch of gods. Did you know that women worshipped different gods sometimes from the men? On different days, in different ways, women did a lot of yelling. We're going to be talking more about that. They sometimes, there were certain temples that sometimes only men could enter. Other temples, only women could center, enter. It was a very, very segregated religion. Even Plato said that if you are going to design an ideal state, the way to begin is to decide which festivals are religious festivals for men, which festivals are religious festivals for women, and which they may both attend. The Athenians went one step better. They even had separate religious festivals for the prostitutes. But Paul says something different in 1 Corinthians 11. Let's go back and look at it again. He is arguing against sex segregation. I believe this is something we need to stress. Sometimes women want to get into one corner and men want to get into another corner. Or sometimes we say women can't have any part in the decision making of this church. And the women say, well, good, let's have a women's fellowship and we'll raise money for missions. And that's our mission money. And we'll study missions and we won't let the men know what we're up to. And we'll get all the information about missions in this church. And we'll have a Bible study and we'll learn the Bible and we'll get a corner on the Bible. Is that what the Word of God says? No, let's look at 1 Corinthians 11.11. 11 and see what it is to which uh, God has called us. Neither is the woman apart from the man, nor the man apart from the woman in the Lord. A great unifying principle. Uh, in early Christian churches, sometimes men and women were separated. We know that in the temple, there was a court of women and they couldn't go any further. The Jewish male could get in further than the woman. She just couldn't get as close to God. And Jesus opened up a new and living way. And one of the cardinal things that we learn in the Genesis story and that Paul recycles for us here 
is that we belong to each other. Now, sometimes women get mad and they say, you know, man is the enemy. No, that's not what the Word of God says. The Word of God says, I will put enmity between thee and the woman. You know who he said that to? So if you know people who don't like women, well, you know whose side they're on. <laughs> but God has called us to togetherness. Yesterday we talked about Jesus Christ who makes all things whole together, and in him we are together. Our international organization, of which Christians for Biblical Equality is the American chapter, but the international organization is known as Men, Women, and God. Because we're in this together. We belong to one another. God has given us to one another. Why, in ancient Greece, men and women didn't eat together, they didn't sleep together, they didn't speak, and women had special women's quarters, and uh, men had separate quarters. A woman was not supposed, a married woman might go as far as her front door, but an unmarried girl should never leave the woman's quarters in the very strict homes. What does that do to building understanding? Or how are you going to make the God's people one when they come out of this kind of a tradition? And Paul wants women brought to church. How shocking. Now women on the rampage, the kind of women who uh, worship Dionysus could get very, very wild. And you're gonna see some pictures of how they could end up fighting men. I'm going to show you some pictures of worship services in which there's a lot of sex hostility. And that's one of the things that Paul is debunking here and saying absolutely not. We belong to one another. We are interdependent. On the other hand, there are churches that seem to perpetuate this sex hostility, aren't there? And I remember one woman coming to me in tears and saying, I just can't stand it. Um, when my pastor starts preaching, every time he wants a cheap laugh, he tells a joke, you know, a nasty joke about women. Uh, there aren't going to be any women in heaven because it says there's silence for half an hour. You know, uh, cheap jokes about women, drivers, and so on, constantly putting women down, making them feel, uh, you know, less than human. And then the other thing is that women turn nasty. If people can't have a normal channel that God has given them and as the Holy Spirit calls them and they know they're called to do certain things and they're frustrated and it, they're damned up and the Holy Spirit is quenched, women can turn nasty, can't they? They don't have anything else to do with their brains and they can start fights. Uh, they can try to domineer to manipulate from the bottom. Uh, instead of being honest and forthright and whole people, we think this is one of the reasons that Greek women were so nasty and why Greek men were so scared of them. One young man told Socrates he'd rather meet a lion or a bear rather than meet his mother. They didn't know. And in fact, one of the things that absolutely stunned the ancient world and stunned the ancient philosophers was the way women found marvelous outlets in Christ. And they turned around and started ministering to the poor. They went to where there were sick people. Of course, a pagan husband wasn't very anxious to have his, his wife get out and go down the street to some little shack and take care of the sick. But Christian women got a whole new set of interests. A whole, they began to try to educate children. Some of them did have an education themselves, and they got concerned, and they reached out. And one pagan philosopher said, heavens, what women these Christians have. How transforming when Jesus came in and when people began to understand that they were the one body of Christ. But now what are you going to do with a woman who has to stay indoors all the time and she, if she's going to go out she has to be veiled and what are you going to do when you bring her to the house of God so that you don't create a first class scandal? Well, I'd suggest that you better have her dressed appropriately. And Paul asks for that. So I think there are a couple of different things going on when Paul asks
to have his women folk veiled. Now, the word veil, as you probably know, never turns up once in this passage in 1 uh, Corinthians 11. Uh, the thing that does turn up is having the head covered. Some people think it just means having their head uh, done up on top of their hair, uh, you know, their hair done up properly and not loose and flowing. When we get to looking at some of these pictures of the wild women worshiping Dionysus, you're going to see hair all over the place. And uh, some people think that it is just asking for hair that is orderly. But by and large, women, when they went out in the street, did veil. And Jewish women veiled. And an interesting fact is that at Tarsus, where Paul was born and spent his young years, where he returned several times, like after he got lowered in a basket uh, over the wall at, at Damascus, he went to, back to Tarsus. And a writer living about 100 AD said, well, every woman you meet is veiled. They've only got one eye they can look out of. But I bet they're just as lewd as anybody else with that one eye. Um, and so propriety did demand that women be veiled. And I think we need to understand that. It was a very scary, risky thing for a man who had just found Christ to dare to lead his wife out of the women's quarters. She only got out otherwise to burst out, rampage on the mountain and misbehave and so on. It had been a very risky thing. And was this going to turn her into a lewd woman to bring her out? Well, we better make sure that we observe the proprieties. And I believe that this is the reason that it says in <clears throat> verse 10 that a woman ought to have power on her head, the right to get out, but she's to wear something on her head. Now many people, most translations translate this because of the angels. But angelos also means messenger. We read in the book of Acts that the Christians were assembling right next door to the synagogue. You know who was probably looking through the windows and maybe even walking in. And particularly for a Jewish woman, to go without a veil was a sign of unchastity. Indeed, a Jewish woman could be divorced if she appeared in public without a veil. Now Dionysus worshipers I'm going to show you some more of them. There are women without any veil and many of them with their hair flying every which way. Paul is going to ask that his women be appropriately covered. I've already suggested to you, remember I showed you those nice pictures of women worshiping in the buff? Maybe daisies and, and, and how, LaDonna, do you mind having such pictures shown in your church? <laughs> I guess if it happened 2,000 years ago, it's all right to show pictures like that, huh? Um, but I wanted you to see for yourself. I wanted you to get some understanding of, of what a worship service looked like. And maybe you know why there were laws governing the free practice of religion. I even told you that women could get so worked up that they would seize young animals. And they would tear these animals apart. These are the pagans, mind you. And eat the flesh while it was raw, warm, and quivering, thereby getting the life of the god inside themselves. That was called enthusiasm. Enthusiasmos. We don't use the word quite that way today, did we? Do we? <clears throat> but what are you going to do? And, and this uh, tearing the animals apart and so on seems to have been largely a women's ritual. I mean, they were really off the wall. What are you going to do when you bring a woman like that to the house of God? And you serve the Lord's Supper. <clears throat> and do you know a very interesting thing? This part about being veiled and so on in 1 Corinthians 11 comes right before Paul's major teaching about the Lord's Supper in the rest of 1 Corinthians 11. And he's talking about the way people should and should not behave at the Lord's Supper. Did you know that? <clears throat> and certainly this whole idea of gender or of sexuality was very, very important. And it was terribly important in a community that thought as freely and as fully about sex as Corinth did. Not only did they have the garden variety prostitutes, some of the richest and the smartest, oh, and they wrote such cute books about all the clever sayings of the prostitutes. Uh, it is said that you could get really quite a thick book if you put all those sayings together. Many, many of them were from Corinth. And the city got very rich. On top of that, up on the hill, there was a temple to Aphrodite, the goddess of love. <clears throat> 
And she was served by many, many sacred prostitutes. One of the ways you worshiped was by <coughs> having intercourse with a prostitute in the temple of Aphrodite. Now, <clears throat> you may say, oh, how disgusting. Yes, but let me tell you that they view these women as having religious power. You may think that, that this is um, <coughs> quite where you're coming from. That's all right. I'm talking about people who've been dead for 2,000 years. And <coughs> the poet Pinder praised a man who gave 50 prostitutes to the temple of Aphrodite. Now, wasn't that a nice present to the temple? Uh, you want a present like that for the church, LaDonna? <laughs> You'll skip that one. <laughs> but 50 consecrated women who can give their hearts and lives to Christ, that's something else. In fact, the, the Greeks even believed that it was the prayers of the prostitutes at the temple of Aphrodite that had sent a storm that wrecked the Persian fleet so that Corinth didn't get invaded. And sometimes the city of Corinth would, even when they wanted to represent the city, have prostitutes get all deck up to, pray, to play the part of the city. They did a lot of thinking and a lot of discussion about sex and what it was, whether it was better to be heterosexual or homosexual, what their feelings were about women. And Paul takes it head on. He takes it on very, very frankly. And I wanted to deal a little bit with some of the things Paul says. One that I want to look at particularly with you, we talked about woman as well as man being made in the image of God. Notice chapter, <clears throat> I mean, verse 7 in chapter 11. Uh, For a man ought not to cover his head, since he is the image and glory of God, and woman is the glory of man. And we say, oh, there it goes. Now, it doesn't say that woman is the image of God because she isn't. I mean, woman isn't the image of man because she isn't. She's the image of God. But what does it mean to be the glory? Everybody seems to think that means sort of a dimmer, reflected, you know, glory. Is that really a put down? To be the glory of the glory? Is that all that bad? Gilbert started to read to us yesterday some of the things in 2 Corinthians about how Moses' face was veiled and people couldn't even look at his face because of the glory that shone there. Was that a put down to glory, to, to veil that glory? And it, what about the phrase change from glory into glory? That's bad? No. Glory is anything that raises the worth or reputation or pride of the person who possesses it. That wasn't how Greek men felt about their wives. <clears throat> Once upon a time, there was a Greek gentleman. Uh, he lived in the first century <clears throat> A.D. No, I'm sorry, he was B.C. And he went over and visited the Romans. And he looked around Roman society. And he saw that the Romans had a perfectly appalling custom. They weren't even embarrassed to take their wives out to dinner. Much that in Rome we hold to be correct is thought shocking in Greece. No Roman thinks it an embarrassment to take his wife to a dinner party. At home the wife holds first place in the house and is the center of its social life. Things are very different in Greece, where the wife is never present at dinner unless it is a family party and spends all her time in a remote quarter of the house called the women's quarter, which is never entered by a man unless he is a very close relation. Now, I told you I was going to tell you an appalling story. Once the Athenian army was doing very badly, they always did better at sea, and the uh, army began to fall back, back, back through the streets of Athens, and the women were terrified. What had happened to their husbands? What had happened to their sons, to their brothers? And then they did something absolutely awful. Of course. Furthermore, if the enemy came in, they'd have captured all these women and made them slaves. So Greeks were very good at taking slaves and perfectly awful to slaves. And so the women were so frightened that they crept to the windows and they crept to the doors and they called out, have you seen my husband? The, the account says their knees were shaking. What about my brother? Tell me about my son. When everything got straightened out in Athens, you know, had managed to win, 
Uh, they had a court inquiry about it because those women had been seen at the doors and the windows and it was a disgrace to the city. And <clears throat> when at another point there was a uh, great uh, celebration to honor the fallen heroes from the war, Pericles, the great orator, made a speech and he commended Athens on having such wonderful sons. He spoke consolingly to the sons of those who had died and then he spoke to the widows and said, just remember, greatest will be her, mem her honor who is never mentioned for good or ill outside her own house. And Jesus called women to go into all the world and preach the gospel. Now Paul has got the just plain nuts and bolts job of getting these women into the house of God and then out of the house of God and on about the job of sharing the gospel. And one of the things that he tells men is that women are their glory. That's good news. That's not bad news. It's calling them to take their place side by side with the men. Now I must also tell you that it was a way of addressing an issue that haunts modern society as well as ancient society. And that is a question of where you're going to find your soulmate and who you're going to love. As Christians, we're to love everybody. And as Christians, our, our concern reaches out to those we don't know, and we, we pray very hard for those we don't love. Jesus tells us even to pray for our enemies and do good to them. And uh, we find it's a very big order. But we also need to think through the need for marriage. Now, I would like to say very categorically that Paul is very unusual because he gave people the liberty not to get married. A woman really didn't have that liberty until this point. She could, um, she was pretty, there weren't enough women to go around. Incidentally, I just read that there are 127 marriageable young men for, a hun for every 100 marriageable young women uh, in the uh, 25 to, or 22 to 27 year old bracket. Did you know that? There just aren't enough women to go around. And so women were at a priority and they could be, well, it was just uh, often you use them and married them off to make a political alliance, a business alliance, to improve yourself socially, and there was a lot of wheeling and dealing. These girls were often married off, uh, usually between the ages of 10 and 14. Now even Aristotle, who was a woman hater, said, if we couldn't, uh, if we would just wait until these girls had passed puberty, we wouldn't have so many of them dying in childbirth. And many, many women did ch deal in childbirth. Now, Paul says uh, that fathers, now there are two ways to translate a lot of what is going on in 1 Corinthians 7. It could mean either to marry or to give in marriage. But I suggest that he is talking about not marrying off girls who are not ready to be married off. Until they have reached the flower of their age, don't marry them off. And after that, only marry them if they want to get married. They have that choice. You see, some people think Paul is a marriage hater. And I don't think he's a marriage hater at all. I think he is setting things in a new perspective. And Christian women in the first few centuries found it was very exciting not to get married. That doesn't always look so attractive to us today. But I would like to say that Paul offered both men and women a chance not to get married if they didn't want to. And I would suggest that if you want to look at that, we don't have time to go into it thoroughly, but it's in 1 Corinthians uh, 7, beginning at verse 25 and reading on. And I would suggest, uh, particularly uh, in uh, verse 36, Notice that he carefully says you don't go marrying off a girl until she is in the flower of her age, until she has passed puberty. You marry her because you, she wants to get married. Many of these young girls were literally torn away from their mothers, crying and screaming. The day before they got married, they took their dolls and dedicated them to Artemis in the temple. 
Can you imagine your 14-year-old daughter? I mean, that's the outside, that's usually the oldest. Taking her teddy bears and, you know, stuffed animals and all that and giving them away and getting married the next day. Taking on that responsibility. No wonder there were so many unhappy marriages. Men married reluctantly. They had bought into all this garbage about um, women. And we know that they often uh, stayed away from their wives' bed. At one point, Pericles even passed a law that a man had to sleep with his wife three times a month because they wanted more citizen-level citizens so they could have a better army. That's how bad it was. Where were men turning? Sometimes to the prostitutes who did get out and were very interesting to talk to. They were called hatiri. And sometimes they turned either to other men or to boys. And I think that you have to see why. We've talked about a lot of this already. That um, women were considered nasty. They'd been invented to get people into trouble. They had evil natures. They were disagreeable. And they were best avoided. You only married if you had to because the old folks poked you into it when there had to be another generation. And often people, frankly, were scared of women's sexuality. They thought it was very bad news. Uh, many people tried to repudiate this. Uh, there's a very famous Athenian saying that the woman was only the incubator of the child. She wasn't even the parent. Her active role was repudiated. There are very, very uh, disagreeable things written about women's sexuality. You'd be very upset, and uh, you'd never want to associate with me if I were to tell you the kinds of things that were written because people really didn't like women's baby-making options. And Paul says in 1 Corinthians uh, 11, 12, the man comes out of the woman and the woman comes out of the man. It's a cycle, and you don't need to be scared of it. And he says that women and men are the same substance. Uh, because the final argument for homosexuality was that it was more intellectual. It's the way the philosopher would go. After all, it was always the baser nature that was female, and therefore you could only love a woman if you were giving into the lower part of your nature. And it was unthinkable that perfect virtue could ever reside in a woman. Of course, can't reside in a man either, only in Jesus Christ. And in the Lord we are redeemed people who share together. And so he is calling people to belong to one another. He's calling them to lay aside their, sexual, their, their hostility to one another, to lay aside the segregation that says this is mine and that's the other sexes and we've got a battle between them. He is calling us to oneness in Jesus Christ. I wanted to speak very briefly of another thing women sometimes did with sex hostility. And this happens in 1 Corinthians 14. Now, <clears throat> he tells us right off that prophecy is a special gift that upbuilds the church. And that's important to know that uh, you'll find that in verse 3. The one who prophesies uh, speaks to men for the upbuilding and consolation and exhortation. It's a way to build people up. But Paul spends most of the rest of this chapter discussing some difficulties they've have, they're having, and a lot of it is a problem of noise control. Now, women were very, very noisy when they worshipped, and they got very out of hand. They would go on rampages. They would not only, well, you're going to see in a minute how wild and destructive they really could get. In fact, if you turn over to verse 23, it says, if a person... Uh, if you come together, the whole church comes together, and everybody is speaking in tongues, and someone comes in who is ignorant or doesn't, he's an unbeliever, will they not say that you are mad, insane? We just think that means crazy, huh? Not so, necessarily. In Greek, this word is a technical religious term. That's why they keep characters like me around. Gilbert is going to work with some of this material. Afterwards, he's a New Testament scholar. I'm a classicist. That means I have to reconstruct the ancient world. 
The word can also mean to behave like one of these crazy women. We saw some of them yesterday. We're about to see some more. And they were very, very noisy. They had special kinds of shouts which they made. Uh, you can find this particular kind of cry that women were supposed to make discussed as early as both the Iliad and Odyssey. At first, it was sort of formal. Uh, you just yelled when the animal was sacrificed and hit the ground and all the women yelled. And women were not allowed to make a blood sacrifice. All they could do was yell afterwards. And that's how you knew whether somebody in the next door was offering a sacrifice when you heard the women shout. Well, then <coughs> it began to be offered in, in other times. There's, there's one situation described in a play by Aeschylus where the city of Thebes is being destroyed and, and the women are terrified. There's an invading army at all seven gates and they rush out of their houses. And the king says, get back, you miserable creatures. And they say, oh, just let us go to the statues and pray. The city is going to be destroyed. He said, it's not your job to pray. Men pray, women don't. Men go to the oracle. Women don't get back, get back. And they say, oh, oh, please, please, at least let us pray. And he says, well, I'll tell you what you can do. I'll pray, since that's the proper male task. Notice how women are being shoved out of religion. I'll pray, and then you can raise the women's shout, and all the soldiers will be glad because they'll know somebody's praying. And so he offers the prayer, and the women are allowed to yell. What does this do when you come to the house of God? I once watched a bar mitzvah at the West Wall, also known as the Wailing Wall, in Jerusalem. They had the podium uh, where all the reading was going to take place and the young boy who was going to be bar mitzvahed. And here was the dividing line between the male and the female part. So all the women are over here and the boy is here and all the reverend uh, <coughs> people are coming with their heads covered and so on and they're reading the Torah and there is great meaning and substance and the word of God is being proclaimed and then there are appropriate places where they stop and the women yell -la 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 -la. they throw the candy up in the air and down all over the podium and all over the boy and then the men would start again with the Torah and then the women would shout -la 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 -la. but they knew when to shut up I'll tell you another story this is one Aristophanes tells when the men were arguing about whether or not they had enough money to send a fleet to Syracuse. It was unfortunate that they did. The women tried to stop them in several different ways. They sent that fleet and 50,000 never came home. It was a terrible disaster. But anyway, this is when they're trying to get the money. And so a dignified gentleman is telling them why they must go to war against Syracuse. His wife is next door lamenting one of the gods that only women worshipped. This was the god Adonis. You know, the boyfriend of Aphrodite, the goddess of love. Alas, alas, alas for Adonis. And the husband started to thunder louder to be heard. And she drowned him out with her religious performance. And he yelled louder. And she lamented louder. Women knew perfectly well how to use this device to drown out men. <laughs> I... <laughs> and... And I have heard of situations, even Christian situations, where women will do this kind of thing. Now, there's still ovulation in many places today. In just a minute, I'm going to prove to you that it existed at Corinth. But I am going to suggest that the word that is said is that women should not lalain. And that means to vocalize. It can be a lot of different kinds of vocalization. It's even used in the Bible for the noise thunder makes and that a trumpet makes. And I'm suggesting that since Paul has already said women can pray and prophesy, that he's asking them not to make disruptive noise. Some people think it was because they were too busy buzzing they didn't understand. And then I'm going to suggest that he asks them, when he asks them to be silent, the word doesn't necessarily mean shut up and never talk, because through two other kinds of people in this passage are asked not to speak. If you speak in tongues and there's no interpreter, then please be silent and, and just talk to the Lord. If you are prophesying and the Lord speaks to somebody else, will the first person please be silent? Now, that doesn't mean they can never, never talk again. And so the third one uh, speaks of uh, women being under control, being silent and under control, as also says the law. I'd suggest that's not the law of, um, of ancient Israel, but that that's the law that was existing right there in Corinth, where they were trying to keep women under control. And uh, I, I would suggest that that's what's been doing. Now, I've been talking a little too long. Do we have this, um, 
uh, screen down or can we uh, send it down? I would also, uh, while this is coming down, um, can, can we get it down? Okay. Mention um, that submission sometimes means self-control. And it is used that way in, in this passage. But now I'll tell you uh, what we're going to see first. I'll try to save a little time. I'm going to show you again some of these women worshiping Dionysus. The majority of people who worship Dionysus were women. They carried on so badly that if you go to the Metropolitan Museum in New York, you can see a big stone listing the laws. And it got so badly out of hand in Rome that no more than seven women and three men could gather together because they just made too much <coughs> pandemonium. Okay, let's turn on the, um, uh, the slide, please. And first of all, we should see women out on one of these binges. They still continued into the New Testament period. Fire away as soon as you're ready. And um, Plutarch tells about a rescue party about 100 AD that had to go up on the mountains and rescue these women because they were in a snowstorm. Uh, let's do uh, the first slide. Now, you can see it was a rather fun kind of religion, particularly if you were never allowed out of the house, never talked to, sexually deprived, uh, sometimes even deprived of food. Women uh, did not get as much meat as men. Oh, well, we got the wrong one. That's all right. Here's Dionysus dressed up as a woman. Do you see right over the altar, he is dressed as his own priestess. Do you see half of the deer? And in his other hand, we can't see it so well, he's holding half of a young deer. I told you that women became so destructive that they pulled apart young animals. Okay, let's look at the next one. Uh, someone asked me a question. I'm sorry, I missed it. Okay? Now, this next one is, again, of these dancing wild women called menads or mad ones. And this is the word that I said is used in 1 Corinthians uh, 14.23. Will they not think you are playing the menad? Uh, and here you see them uh, dancing and behaving quite wildly. The one woman here probably has her mouth open, making this distinctive yell called Olelugia that was very much part of Dionysiac cult. They are holding poles, uh, some of them, or you can see the poles, which are called thyrsus. That's one of the reasons that we know that this is a religious picture. Uh, and they have fawn skins, uh, and that is also an animal. All members of the cat family were sacred to Dionysus. Next picture, please. Uh, here is the dancing. We looked at this one yesterday and the dreamy state we're going to see a much wilder state of excitement and of being out of control in the next picture okay see <clears throat> now here she is again slumped over on one side has her animal do you see the snake look at the hair paul is calling women who have been into this and the very word that he is using in the Greek when he says, you were carried away by dumb idols in 1 Corinthians 12, 1 and 2, is a word that describes this kind of behavior. She's not exactly ready to sit down and listen to LaDonna's sermon. Okay, next one, please. <laughs> now here we come to a very interesting story. This is a broken piece of pottery, but do you see that the menad has a piece of arm in her hand? That's King Pentheus. He once dressed up like a woman and hid in a tree so he could spy on the women's rights. And Dionysus told them to get him down. They really thought it was a lion and they pulled him to pieces. It's a very grisly story in Euripides' Bacchae. Yes, these women could be destructive. They, they pulled Orpheus to pieces. They pulled several people to pieces. They were good at also pulling babies to pieces, okay? Um, now here we see some of the sex hostility that I told you was very much part of Dionysus' cult and that I told you sadly is so sometimes part of Christian behavior. Uh, here uh, we see someone who is going to have advantage taken of her. Sadly, there's a lot of sexual harassment in the Church of Jesus Christ today. This is the kind of thing that Paul is speaking against in this chapter. Next uh, slide, please. Sometimes they got just a little too friendly. Notice the thyrsus and the animal. This animal is actually a nursing animal, but I fear the worst for it. Even though it's a, a young panther, it's probably going to be torn apart. Notice, though, it's the woman who has it and the woman who is going to do this disgusting and disgraceful thing, okay? I love to watch women's faces when I start talking about this kind of thing, <laughs> tearing young animals apart. Next slide, please. Um, 
Here uh, we see that rape was sometimes involved. She's holding out her hands to the altar and it isn't gonna do her much good. Okay, next one please. Uh, here we see very clearly the sex hostility that is being displayed. The fighting and the anger, the resistance. Okay, next one. This is just plain teasing, but she's plenty mad. She's got her thyrsus, this pole with either ivy or uh, uh, maybe pine cones tied on the end. And I think she's going to haul him and, you know, build him a good one, and he's got it coming. Okay? This is just teasing, but that can be harassment, too. The kind of thing Paul is speaking out against when he calls us to be one in Jesus Christ. All right? Next one, please. Uh, we got that one by mistake. Okay? We've seen that one. Uh, again, you see both the, uh, the fighting and some kinds of flirting. Again, um, notice the snakes. Incidentally, notice that the men are being portrayed as, as creatures with tails. And we don't know whether they're meant to be real people, but the mean ad, the mad one, is always portrayed as a real live woman. Okay? Uh, this is, a, again, we know it's a worship service. Anytime we see those poles, that tells us it's a thyrsus. When we see women with panther skins or deer skins, that tells us that they are in the middle of a religious ceremony. Maybe you didn't realize how pious these pictures are that I'm showing you this morning, okay? Next one. Um, now, this woman, look, do you see her yell? Do you see her throat and her parted lips? She is engaging in the ceremonial cry, okay? Let's look at the next one. I told you this is called the Olalugia, and this plaque was discovered right at Corinth in a temple that was used very heavily by women. It says Olalungus, it's in the genitive. It proves to us that this kind of yell was alive and well right at Corinth. And I told you Paul asked women to be silent. I am arguing that he is asking them not to ululate. Have you ever heard the word ululate? We still have it in English. Oh, no, 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 no. And uh, he is asking them to shut up and not disrupt the meaning of the service. Okay, I've got one more picture, I think, of that. It just shows you some of the other sacred cries that were raised. The, the one up here in the other corner says pianos. That means of pan. Have you ever heard of raising the pian? Another kind of yell. But these four plaques that were probably all of them dedicated to the sacred cries of women were at Corinth. And so I suggest to you that Paul is not asking women to refrain from preaching or praying that he is calling on them to proclaim the unsearchable riches of Jesus Christ. A Methodist evangelist named Godby in the last century said that the devil's biggest tool was distorting that verse about let women be silent. And I would suggest that he is asking women um, not to be disruptive, but rather to pull together brothers and sisters alike to proclaim the unsearchable riches of Jesus Christ. Thank you. There.